Let's give him praise. Ah, good points, good points tonight. Good to see our brother Robert here tonight. Glad he got an opportunity to break away from work. So yeah, glad you're able to be with us. Be with us here tonight. Always good to have Walt and Betty and all of you guys. And you guys are always faithful on Facebook. So we got a whole virtual family out there that we count. But uh, I like to have you in the sanctuary if you can make it. <clears throat> Because I like to see the look on your face when I say some of the stuff I say. So, <laughs> I don't know if I'm making contact or if I'm on the right track or not. Well, we're going to get started with prayer. Uh, remember, Belinda, I had the stomach bug right after Valentine's Day, and now she's got it. So we just passed it around. But if you would, keep letting me prayers. And uh, <clears throat> pray for Ron Hughes. He had a surgical procedure today. That everything went well, so he's, he's at home resting. Jerry Eversoll had a skin put in yesterday, uh, and he's at home resting. He's doing he's doing well. It's pretty for him. Talked to Brenda uh, Walker before I came over. Uh, they took Tom to the VA in Salem yesterday. Uh, you know, he, he's got liver cancer, but she told me today that they're bringing him home and he's going to be under hospice care. At home. So if you just continue to remember Brother Tom Walker. <clears throat> Went and saw a lady today from Ivanhoe. Her name was Nadine Lennon. Miss Nadine. I had called the prayer request out for her. She's 98 years old. And I, I thought she had done went on. I, I didn't know until Linda had called me. So I went up and saw her today in the nursing home. And it was it was truly a blessing. It was truly a blessing with me and, and Nadine. Her mind was still good. I, I mean, I gave her mind was good. But she had fallen, and Linda had, had found her when she took her, her mail, I think. But I told her we would pray for her tonight, and I said, and I had a prayer with her there. And I was just a kid growing up in Ivanhoe. I remember Nadine. She was, she was a hoot. But anyhow, <clears throat> She finally, finally come to her who I was, and she said, oh, yeah, now, now I remember who, you, you the one who used to run up and down that break shooting birds out of I said, I'm one, Nadine, I'm one, and we shoot them blackbirds on that break. And then she said, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you come pray with me. And then I was going out the door, and she said, she said, tell the nurses to bring me one of them orange cream sodas up here. <laughs> I said, well, I'll mention it on the way out. They might do that. So, bless her heart. But pray, pray for Nadine. Nadine Weatherman. Marie Sheep, uh, Charlie's wife. I just talked to Charlie. Uh, they're home. He said they died in the with vertigo. I went and saw Cecil Murphy today. So, pray for Brother Cecil. He was having a good day today. They said it's, it's sinuses and infections and swelling in there that's causing him to be dizzy and have the problems he's having. But he was having a good day today, and I'll share a story with you here. He did share it with me anyway. He was here. And I said, well, uh, Charlie B. Had, had called me Monday and told me that you weren't doing well, and he said he was... He was having some reservations about hanging on. <laughs> That's the way I feel you know, put it. He said, I won't tell you. He said, I just told the Lord. He said, I just prayed and said, just take me home, Lord. Just take me home. I was so sick. But then he said, I got the feeling better yesterday. <laughs> and then he said, I told the Lord, don't take me home. He said, For, forgive me for praying that prayer yesterday. <laughs> I said, well, I think he was just waiting to see if anybody else was going to pray to keep you here. And I said, he and Charlie and Barbara and the church decided we needed you. So he answered that prayer. He said, I'm glad he didn't answer that one. I said, Cecil, Brother Cecil. Pray for Sam with you, uh, Brother Sam, uh, from over in Austinville. J.B. says he's in the hospital in Bristol. So I, I don't know what's going on there. I've seen on Facebook where he's had been requesting prayer for Sam. And Randall's got a cousin, Rebecca Taylor, that he wants us to pray for tonight. She has a doctor appointment coming up, I think, so we're going to pray everything's okay with, with Rebecca. Have you got a request to uplift hand tonight? 
and maybe those that you want to share with us. Pastor Mike, there's a, a little boy, he's, well, his name's not Grayson, um, and I'm not sure of his last name, I've worked with his mom for years. Okay. But he's just the first child, he's been in the news for several weeks now. Okay. And some kind of disease that they're having to do a transplant of some sort of infusion. A little fella, he, they had to put a shunt in his head. Oh, goodness. It's just so beautiful to see from time to time with his, his pictures. So y'all just, long story short, he made a little grace. Pray for little grace. Yes. Okay. And there he goes. Bless his little heart. All right. Anyone else? Uh, I talked to <coughs> Gina today. Gina Dunford, about 80. Uh, we did a request of prayer for Amy Funk, and she said she's going to Winston tomorrow to see the doctor. I thought it was today. Uh, she said tomorrow, so I, I may have been today or maybe both, but the, continue to pray for, for Amy, uh, been diagnosed with cancer. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father and Almighty God, we're so thankful that we're able to be here together as a family tonight in the sanctuary. We thank you for those who keep us in the Lord and be faithful and watch us. And those who can pull it up later. Father, we have several who were able to do several who were sick. And we haven't we haven't made everybody. I'm sure we have many that we can do this. We want to pray for these that we can do all here. Father, we know that you are aware of the sicknesses and illnesses and bereavement and everything that's going on in the world. You're aware of that. We come together tonight as a family of believers. We're lifting up every one of them to you, knowing that, knowing that you not only hear our prayer, but you answer the prayer. So just be with the folks we've named all. Brother Cecil tonight, Brother and Sister Darling and Beesman, who's not able to be here. And all these who are ailing, God, we just pray that you, that you touch them and that you heal them to your glory. Thank you, Lord, for these Bible studies and these who come and the opportunity we have to come together. And we're looking forward to it. In your wonderful name, Jesus, we pray. And all the saints that say we love you, Lord. Love you, Lord. Amen, amen and amen. All right, Brother Randall is going to come for the offering. We're going to start announcing it now. We're going to make a poster of it for God. On April the second, uh, we're going to we're going to have a baptizing at two o'clock on that Sunday. We're we're hooking up with Hilltop PH Church. Pastor Todd Gardner called me, and he's been pastoring down there for just about a year, and said he had about a dozen people that would like to be baptized. They don't have a baptistry, and I said, come on over. We'll do that. So I told him, I said, and any other pastors, anybody community-wise that, that wants to be a part of that, we'll just make that a baptism service for, for whoever. So I'm going to want to start announcing that to our church. So anybody that wants to be a part of that, we'll, we'll do that for them. All right, we'll so ask a blessing. Father, may you give them a blessing and another burden. And to the church, move them over and rise again. That she has pulled down and uh, make each one of us grateful in God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Randall. Tonight we have the sisters of the Draper Battle. Elder. <laughs> <laughs> we have our brothers and sisters of the Draper Battle. So would you all stand <laughs> and turn in your hymnals to 168. Oh, God.
it would intersect off to the Mediterranean Sea into, into Ephesus. Corinth was another big center, lower. They were southern, but Ephesus was a real important city. It was the commercial trade route. We had people coming through there from all parts of the world. Now, it was the center of pagan worship of the great goddess Diana, or Artemis, as the Greeks and the Romans called her. Remember, we talked about that in the book of Acts. Uh, remember what happened? A riot broke out over the great goddess Diana. So it's like I, I taught him when we were doing the book of Revelation, we were studying that. But we were talking about the tribulation. I, I had told you then, the way that, the way that people operate as groups, once you come in together with a group, once you form a group, generally what happens is, is you form commerce. Uh, I mean, that's what you have to, you have to eat, right? So you, you have, you have ways to make money, to get food, to make money, to get food. So it, it starts out. But then on that, on top of that, you get what? You get government. So, so somehow it has to be governed as to who's going to do what, when, and how. So, so you, get a, you get kind of a government set up, and you get some rules in place so that everybody's heading in the same direction, hopefully. That's just the way humans come together as a group. And on top of that, what, what comes in on top of the government? Religion. Always religion. The, it, it just happens. Out of a group, you, it always follows that pattern. And that's just exactly the way it is with the, in the tribulation in the book of Revelation that describes that. And what happens is, more often than not, the commerce <clears throat> becomes affiliated with the religion more so than the government does. Usually, that's how, that's how it works together. But when the government does come involved, such as with Constantine, who was a Roman emperor that made Christianity the world religion, well, you and I know that you can make it the world religion, but everybody still ain't going to worship Christ. Even though you say this is the law, this is what you're going to do, as Constantine did, it still didn't happen. So <clears throat> Ephesus, being the big center of trade that it was, had a big commerce system. Rome was in charge of the governing body, and Rome had hundreds of gods, and they didn't care which God you worship, as long as it as long as it didn't go against their emperor. You still you still had to pay homage to their emperor. You could worship any God you wanted to, but you still had to have respect for their emperor. But the Jews were a different different group who worshiped Jehovah God, and the Romans left them alone as long as they stayed out of Romans business. As long as they stayed out of the government business. They didn't care what the Jews did among themselves. So that's what you had in Ephesus. And then you had the pagan worship of the great goddess Diana, who was who supposedly had been sent from heaven to them. And of course, Paul, Paul came in there and, and they said, he said she ain't really a god. And that's when they all got upset. It all fell apart. So that's what happened at the big riot. Now, the Jews that were in Ephesus, remember them? <clears throat> they ended up there after being exiled from Rome. Rome exiled the Jews two times in history. And they were scattered out with dispersion, as it's called, across the world. So that's how some of them ended up in Ephesus. And the ones that were there, they became com completely Hellenized. Remember when we talked about the Hellenists in the book of Acts? Who were they? Who did we say the Hellenists were? They're Greek Jews. They're, they're Jews. They're Jews by ethnicity, but they follow Greek culture. And they were called Hellenists. If you remember the first problem that the early church dealt with was the widows of the Hellenists, of the Greek Jews, 
were getting their daily rations. Remember that? And, and we had said at that point that that was a turning point in the church. It could have very easily divided and been two churches. You could have had a Jewish Christian church and you could have had a Gentile Christian church. And they could have went two directions. But the Holy Spirit stepped in and there were seven guys who were filled with the Holy Spirit who came together and resolved the issue so that there was not a split but that the church was still united. So that's where we were when we got to, to Ephesus. The Jews in Ephesus were Greek Jews. So they were of the Greek culture. So worshiping this great God, Diana, would have not been foreign to them, e even though they, they were Jews by ethnicity, doesn't mean that they were all, they were all Jehovah Jews, we could say. Now, the author of this book is who? <clears throat> yeah, the Apostle Paul. And he wrote this letter during his time that he was being held in Rome for two years awaiting the trial with Caesar. Remember the last part of the book of Acts when we were studying that? He was sent to Rome and the centurion took the rest of the prisoners uh, wherever it was they had to go, but they put a sergeant in charge of Paul and he was able to live in his own house for how long? Two years. And while he was there, he was allowed to have guests. They were allowed to come and see him and he was allowed to teach them. So some of these guests who had come in to see him while he was in Rome, no doubt, had come from Ephesus. He had established the church in Ephesus before he left. In chapter 20 of the book of Acts, I think it's 20 or maybe 21, I think it's chapter 20. Chapter 20, the last, the last part of that chapter, it's sad when we see when he had to leave them. Remember, they fell on his neck and they all loved him and they didn't want him to go. Well, <clears throat> that, that was pretty much his last visit there at that time. Uh, history says he did go back for a brief period, but there was, no, there was no record of what happened with that visit. But anyway, he stayed in his rented house and he was allowed to have guests, and that's where he wrote this letter to the Ephesian church. And he said it, we'll find out in the opening of the letter, by a guy named Tychus, or Tychicus, or how do you pronounce that? He wrote three other letters also. He wrote the letter to the Colossians, the Philippians, and to Philemon. All four of these were written while he was in Rome in that house in prison. The day on it, Paul had visited the city uh, in the book of Acts, when we read about him being there, was around 53 to 55 A.D. Now, how long was that after Christ had ascended? Six years. Twenty, about twenty years. Christ, Christ ascended. Twenty, twenty. Christ ascended when he was a. Well, you could say 30 to 33 years old. Four years old. Uh, that's when Christ ascended? Was 4 AD? That's when he was born. I think. Yeah. He was born around, he was born around, well, 4 BC is what they think. But they call it AD. Yeah. But it was, if he, if he died at 30, then, you know, he, he would have ascended the same year. But some say he died at 33. 30, 33. Depending on how you count from when he was born. But anyway, this would have been about 20 some years later after Christ had ascended that the gospel would have been spread. Remember we talked about that with the Apostle Paul and how long it was from the time, from the time that Christ had went back. Now it was during that time that, that he was in Ephesus that he established the church there. And that's in Acts chapter 19 and 20. You can go back and read those chapters, review them, and you'll see how he ended up there. But after he left in chapter 20, he would venture back to Jerusalem. 
Remember when he went back to Jerusalem? And when he went back there and he went to the elders of the church, you remember all that. And they told him he was going to have to do this and do that. And James, the elder, the half-brother of Jesus, he said, this is what you need to do in, in order to keep peace among all of them. And he followed James's advice. Remember that? He, he got some guys with him. They all went into the temple. He paid for them to be uh, consecrated. It's what we would call it as part of that ritual. And he found peace in doing that. Well, <clears throat> all that happened after he, had, after he had left Ephesus. But eventually he would be arrested there and tried again, and then he would be sent to Rome. So the letter was written sometime between 55 AD and 62 AD, or 63 AD, somewhere, somewhere in there. Four or five years had, had, probably, had probably passed. And, and you say, well, what's, what, what's it matter about those days? It, it really don't. But when you look at the history of things and see how they progress, you know, th this thing didn't happen overnight. Uh, I, I mean, you know, we're 2,000 years down the road into this church. So when we see, we see things beginning to happen and unfold and, and we think, well, it's not going to happen, these guys took a lot of time to get things established and get them in place and get things happen before things, other things begin to happen. So it was somewhere 62 to 63 that he wrote it. Now the theme of the book, and this is, uh, this is just something that people have, have added in there, or what they see as the theme. When we study it, we'll, we'll pick up on that. But the theological theme, or if we're to look at it and say, well, what, what does it teach us about God? The theological theme of the letter is the glorious church, the church, because the letter unveils the mystery of the church. See, uh, up until Christ, the religious system was run by the Jews and the Jewish hierarchy. It was not about the common people. But when Christ came, he built his church of common people. And, and anybody, anybody, can be saved. Anybody can come to Christ. Anybody can become part of that church. That was totally different from anything they had ever, they had ever heard of because the way they looked at it, he was nothing but, but just a leader that was gathering people for himself to take over Rome. That's why they killed him. They pretty much thought that's, that, that was his goal, but it wasn't his goal. So in a letter to the Ephesians, the theological part of that is Paul explains, by way of the Holy Spirit, the mystery of the church. And here, here's what the mystery, now to them it was a mystery, to you and I it's not a mystery. We, we got the word. We've got it all spelled out for us. And the mystery to them was that God would form a body of people of all nationalities to unite in faith in Christ and then this body of people would express the fullness of Jesus as the Messiah to all people. Now see, that was totally different than anything they expected would ever happen. That, that's, why, that's why Christ, when he had compassion on the multitudes, he stood on, up on a hill when he looked at them and he, and he said, they're, they're like sheep without a shepherd. So if he said, pray that the Lord of the harvest will do what? That he will send workers, laborers, into his field. Well, that's what we are. The field is the earth. We're still laborers. He has been sending laborers into it ever since, ever since his ascension, when it all started with, with the apostles. But it was a mystery to them now that everybody, Jew or Gentile, could be saved, and that how could all be united under one God who in the eyes of the Jews was only the God of Abraham. And, and, and Paul fought with that. And the apostles fought with that. And the Christian church fights with that. T today, among the Orthodox Jews and 
and among the unbelievers. It, it's still hard for everybody to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. But that's what we have to do in order to be saved. And, and it's still the rule. So anyway, that's what the theology part is, how the church united all nationalities, and how that God would empower and equip these believers by way of his Holy Spirit to take the gospel to the world. How did we come to know the gospel? Somebody told us. Somebody, somewhere, told us about it. We, we may not even remember the first time we heard it, or what it was that we heard it, or how we heard it, but we began to hear more about it, and we would listen to bits and pieces, and at some point, we, we make a decision either to pursue it and find out more about it, or just to not. <laughs> just, just to live your life and, and have your own belief or whatever you want to do. But God is still empowering people today through the Holy Spirit that lives in us when we're born again. He comes into our heart and we become his witnesses just exactly like he told the apostles they would be into Judea and Samaria and to all the world. Now, now those apostles that day, they didn't even know Draper Valley existed. It was here on the earth. It hadn't been named yet. I don't guess. <laughs> but it was, it was here. The region was here. The area was here. And somehow the area got the gospel all the way from Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost. And, and how it started out somehow. And we're still spreading it. We're still spreading it today. We're still spreading that gospel. So that's, that's the theme of what he's writing the Ephesians about, is how that happened. Now the purpose of, of writing, the Ephesian people will we'll see that as we get into it. The Ephesian people were very fearful of evil spirits. And as a people, they depended on the gods to protect them. That, that's, the, that's the thing about what we would say the secular gods is because that's why Rome had so many, Greek had so many, and, and that's why all these religions have gods. They, they need somebody to protect them. They, they need somebody greater than they are to protect them, that will watch out for them, that, that they can answer to. So that's, that's where the religions are based. That's where they are they are formed. That's why they have leaders. Some follow men, some follow myths, some worship animals, some worship the sun, the moon, and the stars, and whatever it is that they think that's, that's greater than them, that, that watches over them or protects them, is what they, what they fear when it comes to having a God. Now, Paul would divide this letter into two sections six chapters of it. The first three chapters covers the believer's position in Christ. Who are we in Christ Jesus? Just, you know, we're, we're born again. We believe the gospel. We accepted him. He gave us that spiritual rebirth. We became children of God by that way, by the adoption as sons and daughters through Christ. But where is our position today in Christ? Well, that's what Paul was showing the Ephesians. To, to the Ephesians, everything that they had been taught or everything they had heard, you're, you're looking 20 years down the road. Man, that was history. I mean, this happened 20 years ago. You, you know, you're preaching stuff to me that happened 20 years ago. What's happening now? <laughs> I mean, what's happening? Imagine how Paul would have felt if he had thought, well, Paul, 2,000 years from now, we're still going to be talking about this letter you're getting ready to write. He never dreamed that. Just like Luke never dreamed when he wrote the book of Acts, that's what God was doing with him. But God knew what he was doing with those guys. 
So that's just like this life with us. It, you know, we're, we're the generation that's continuing what that generation did as far as sharing the gospel. Now the second half of the book, the last three parts of it, covers the believer's obedience to Christ. To walk worthy of the calling. It's one thing to say that we're Christian. It's another thing to show that we're Christian by what we believe and how we react to what we believe. How, how, we, re, how we respond to that. The writer to the Hebrews and trying to explain what faith is. You ever tried to explain to anybody what faith is? What is faith? That, 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 yeah, there's the textbook answer right there. The scholar in the crowd. I don't know. So okay, so what does faith? What does that mean? <laughs> I heard your definition. Well, it's like it? the wind. It's like the wind. You can't see it, but you can feel it. You can feel. You feel the effects of it. You feel the effects of the wind, and so you feel presence of the Lord and, and you feel you know, you have well I'm, oh you're in good company I can't explain it yeah, it's, just out there. it's just out there it's faith it's faith it's all you need to know it's faith, it's faith. And yeah it is it, it's hard it's, it's really hard to put into words to say whether I have it or don't I because Jesus told the disciples, he said, if you got faith as a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. You ever tried to move a mountain? <laughs> well, faith, faith wasn't talking about a literal, literal mountain. Well, how do you know that? Through faith. <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. How, how are you able to say he wasn't talking about it? So I'm not mountains arguing. in your life, the big mountains you have in your yeah. life, those yeah. obstacles. See what these four guys were up against? <laughs> That's what they were up against. And that hasn't that hasn't changed. So so when you when you try to talk about faith, see they, they had they had the faith in those pagan gods and the great goddess Diana, that she would give them plenty of children and that they would be protected because she was, according to their mythology, the daughter of Zeus. Who remember they thought Paul was in the Barnabas. <laughs> they thought they were gods. So they they believed that to the point that everything that happened in their life, or everything that happened around them, somehow came from that God of which they believed in. So now we're offering our God who is the one true God. And then they say, well, how do you know he is? You just know. You just know when you know her, but it's by faith that you know that. But it, it has to be something that somebody finds out on their own. You, you, can, never, you can never explain that to them. That's why I said we're a good company. You know, the writer of the Hebrews said, yeah, well, here's what faith is. It's the substance of things hoped for. Mm. Well, wait a minute. It's the substance of things hoped for. It's made up. Substance means to make up. So it's made up of things hoped for, but yet it's not seen. Substance of things hoped for, but not seen. Well, I can't see it. It's like the wind. So what are you saying? Well. How many of you have ever been to Iceland? <laughs> How many believe there is an Iceland? Yeah, there are. But you ain't ever been there. It's on the map. It's on the map. There you go. That's what I was thinking of. It's on the map. It's on the map. I'm teaching on faith. Hang on just a minute. Hang on. It's kind of like, too, if uh, you don't know what you don't know. You know what I mean? You can't know what you don't know. You don't know about faith till you have it. That's why I told Sonny Hunter if you made him mad. I said, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know the things you don't know. Yeah, you don't, don't know, know it till you know it. 
His picture, his picture is this on the dollar bill. Who is it? Hey, you know. Somebody said, somebody said this is George Washington. Now, I don't have any reason to doubt it's not, but I can't prove that. I don't know anybody that knows him. There's nobody around that ever saw him. There's nobody left that could prove it. I taught that at the children's home to, to the kids when I'm asking, what do you know about God? Some of them would tell me a little bit. Some of them say, have no idea and don't care. And that's just what they call saying they didn't know anything. All you got to do is look around you. But you got to believe that, don't you? And believing in faith is like the wind. You see the effect of it. That's what she said. Now you're on track. Here we go. So I told the kids that. I said, I, I don't have a reason to doubt that, but here's the point. Somebody told somebody who told somebody who believed what somebody said, and they said that was George, and nobody doubted it. Everybody just said, well, it probably was, but in reality, there is no way to prove. Is that somebody else's opinion? There's no way it's somebody else's opinion now. There's no way. So I would tell them, I said, who's to say that that's not really Benjamin Franklin? Maybe they got the picture swapped. What if it's really Benjamin? on the dollar and George was the one that looked like Benjamin. There's nobody left to ask it. Oh, but it's come down to history and you pretty much. Well, I agree it's not something to argue about, but the point is you don't know. You don't know for a fact. Right? So I was in a pizza hut being with one evening and this girl from on her way to us. That's when you could eat in the pizza huts. And she said, I know you. She said, you're the one that told us about that dollar at the children's home about three or four years ago. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's it. So she said, man, with us. She said, I've got an answer for you. And I thought, if anybody does, if anybody does, it'd be a teenager. <laughs> if anybody can answer it, it'd be a kid. And I said, well, I don't like to hear it. She said, I went to Williamsburg. Anybody been there? I've been to Williamsburg. You did that little cabin where they got all George Washington stuff. That's where she went. She said, I went into this little log house down there. And she said, they had they had some of these papers. They they had a hat. They said that, that was his. She said they even they even had some wooden teeth, lost wooden teeth that they said it belonged to him in this display case, all this. And she said that great big picture, just like some of the dollar was right there on that case where he was. So that's who he was. I said, who told you that was him? She said, the tour guy. The guy that was taking the food. And I said, how old was this tour guy? And she said, oh, he was probably, and she stopped, she said, I see where you're going with this. I said, if he wasn't 200 and some years old, he don't know if it's George either. Well, isn't that the point? Well, I know it sounds ridiculous, but listen, when you're talking to unbelievers, that's what you're up against, church. And that's what Paul was up against. So the only way to know is to have that personal relationship with that person. So if somebody shows a picture of my dad to me and says, this is Glenn Ingo, I'm going to know if it's him or not. Because I know him personally. So when it comes to Christ, and you say, well, how do you know? You see all these different pictures of Christ. Listen, Christ is not a picture. He, he's not a picture. It's not a, he's not an emblem. He's the spirit that lives inside of us. Well, how do you know that? You've got to have him inside of you. You'll never know him from the outside. You have to have him on the inside. And then, as the old evangelist said years ago, you will know in your knower that is him. No, nobody will have to tell you. That's why I preach from the pulpit. If, if you're born again, you don't have to ask, well, am I born again? You'll know you're born again. You'll know. 
and you become born again through faith. Through that belief in what we have been told down through the years by people who knew him and people who he lived in and how that those people have gone on and he is still in other people. There, there's, there's a bunch of saints that are in heaven that have left this church since I've been here. But Christ hasn't left it. He, he was in them and they left it, but he's, he's in you. And he's in us. And if the world stands and there's a generation behind us, he'll be in them. And they'll be studying the same things we're studying, and they'll be talking about the same things we're talking about. Simply because of the faith that we put in him. The faith that we put in Christ. It never changes. Never changes, see? Because he don't change. That's why Paul had to keep writing these letters back to these people. This was first century. And things were already falling apart in the Paul church. Had, he had something going and he was fighting something else too. The old law. The old, the old law. law. That's exactly right. The, the old religious law. Exactly. And that's what the problem was with the Jews. They were afraid to leave what they had been taught. From generation to generation to generation, this is how you're saved. You got to go through the sacrifices. You got to go through the Passovers. You got to follow these rituals. You got to follow this law. You have to do this. You have to, you can't abandon that. That's why they got up to Paul. He's saying to do away with Moses and do away with the laws. Well, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I come to fulfill the law. Because he was the ultimate sacrifice. But it was, it was scary for them to say, okay, <clears throat> I'm going to leave this thousands of years of traditional teaching and I'm going to believe what this itinerant preacher says from now on. And I'm going to put my faith in him. I am going to trust him with my very soul. And, and that's a big decision for anybody to make. But Paul knew that we was making it right because Paul knew. It. Paul saw it. that whether you believe that or not, it makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> I don't believe a guy would ever sit down and make this stuff up knowing he was going to be killed for. It just wouldn't be beneficial. And if that had been the case, we still wouldn't be talking about it here tonight. It would have been long gone. There would have been something else to take its place. But the purpose was the people were very fearful of evil spirits. And they depended on the gods to protect them. And that's where we are today. We are depending on Christ to save us, aren't we? That's what I'm dependent on. I'm depending on him to save me. And, and because I do that, I have put my faith in that, then my life should reflect that. Right? Uh, I mean, if I believe that he's alive and I believe he's going to save me, then in my practice of my faith, then I shouldn't be deterred when a prayer is not answered immediately. Uh, I should I should say I trust him. I trust him. Father Murphy said, "Take me home, Lord." And he said, "I'm glad he did." <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, human. It, it's human. It's it's the human part, and we have to pass by that and put our faith in Christ. He goes back to what Job said. Can't beat what Job said. Though he slay me, yet will I believe. My Redeemer lives. And that's what you have to get to. That's what Paul was trying to tell these Ephesians. And, and the book of Colossians is almost word for word. It's pretty close to the same book. Now, the personal application, what does it do for us? Uh, <clears throat> the Bible is not a history book. You hear me say that all the time. It is a living document. It is the Word of God that speaks to us as individuals. That's why each of us can read a particular scripture or a passage 
and to see something totally different, but still be right. We can still be right in how we interpret it or how it's given unto us, or we can see something in it <clears throat> that maybe somebody else didn't because it's a living document. But if you don't know the author, it's just a book. If you don't know Christ, it's not going to make any sense to you. It, it, it's not logical. It doesn't follow any particular pattern. You know, I, I saw, the, saw the other day, this, this guy, he's a seminary professor in Dallas. And he was talking to a student. And, and he was, the student was saying, well, I don't understand why the world is so full of Bibles. They don't always buy the And he said, son, have you ever read the Old Testament? Have you ever read the Old Testament? He said, son, haven't you read where they fought all the time? Where they killed women and children and babies and bulls and cows and dogs and cats. And have you read the Old Testament where they were running with each other's wives and where the men were running with men? He said, Have you read all that in the Old Testament where all this violence takes place? He said, Haven't you read? He said, There's nothing new in the world. It was always in the world. It's why he said, The Bible is full of violence. It's there. So he said, how could you say, why well, we got all this? He said, you're in the world. You're living with humans. And as long as you're in the world with humans, that's what you're going to deal with. It. And if Christ comes and gets rid of all the humans, which will happen one day, and we'll all be in glorified bodies. But the personal application, the letter imparts to us the blessing of grace that God has bestowed upon us through salvation in Christ. The blessing of grace that God has bestowed upon us through salvation in Christ. Do you realize what a blessing that is? That's why you want the Ephesians. That's what we learned from that book, this book as we study. It also encourages us to believe that when we walk in the Spirit, and he'll, he'll, make, he'll emphasize this big in the last three chapters. When we walk in the Spirit, we have the spiritual authority over evil. How is that? Through the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. They were afraid of evil spirits. They needed a God to protect them. Paul says, Jesus is that God. He came back from the dead. He has no fear over you. It can't hurt him. And it won't hurt you. Oh, it might kill your body. Jesus said, don't fear the one who can kill the body. But fear him who can kill body and soul by casting it into hell. So the body is temporary, but the soul is eternal. So Paul was trying to get these Ephesians to know what faith in Christ really is and what it really was and what it really means to be a Christian. And you can just imagine the world they was in and in the world that we are in. So that's, that's pretty much where they are. Where we are. Could you imagine if Paul were, were still around and wrote a letter to America? You know, Martin Luther did a so Martin Luther King Jr. did a sermon on that. Pull it up. Pull it. If you got YouTube or on your phone or sometime, you got time and, and you want to spend some time, all you have to do is put in the search bar uh, on YouTube. Just put in there Martin Luther King Jr. Paul's letter to America. And he preaches a he preached an excellent sermon on that. And, and to sit there and listen to it when it was done back in the 60s, it sounded like he could have preached it Sunday. That everything that he told what he was taught is today. And even though it was that many years ago. Alright, questions or comments?
Find me a definition of faith and bring it back like that teenager did. I got an answer for you on that George Washington thing. Father, we thank you tonight for these who are here. Thank you, Lord, that they thank you that they were interested in you. I know they love you, and I know they worship you. But Father, it's very easy for us to take for granted that we were children. But because that we know that we are, we forget about those who don't know what we know. And, and it becomes easy for us when we discuss when we discuss the principles of belief and the principles of faith. But Father, there's an unbelieving world out there who doesn't know what we know, and they don't know you. And it's hard for us to get that across to them. That's why you have you have empowered us to be a witness. To be a witness. We just we just testify to you. Well, I, I'm born again. He lives in my heart. Well, I don't understand this, he'll say. Well, they never will. You told us that the, that the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. We've learned that because we have his Spirit. But there's a lot who don't. So help us as we study, as, as we become more and more into discipleship, and we also become evangelists, that we can somehow allow you to use us to win somebody else unto you. So that person will be a part of the church, and they too will be able to win somebody to you. And we'll give you all the thanks and the praise and the glory for it. It's all in your name, Jesus. We say it by faith, and all the saints would say, we love you, Lord. Love you, Lord. Amen. And amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming. Pray for the service on Sunday. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Thank you, Randy.